Hi, and welcome to the show, where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we welcome back Erica Moseson. She's a pulmonary and critical care physician, and she's the founder of Air Health, Our Health. She wrote the Kevin MD article, An Anniversary, Reflecting on COVID-19 and Combustion. Erica, welcome back to the show. Thank you very much for having me. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but for those who didn't listen to our first conversation, can you just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today? Absolutely. So I'm a pulmonary critical care medicine physician. Um, I practice out here in, in Oregon. And I first got involved um, with becoming more passionate about air quality and tobacco control, just seeing it in the ICU. I think a lot of the times, you know, when you're just kind of going to work every day, a lot of us as physicians are just, um, you know, taking care of sick person after sick person after sick person in the ICU. I'm taking care of them as they're dying. Um, and I, you know, really started to, you know, you, you worry about burnout and I really wanted to focus more upstream on, you know, how do I prevent people from, from getting here, you know, cause you're holding the hand of someone's, you know, loved one who's dying. And it's just so heartbreaking that they're there because of cigarettes or they're there because of disease that's either caused or worsened by air pollution. Um, and so I had started getting um, more involved. The American Lung Association had asked me to kind of speak to the legislators um, in my home state a little bit and some policymakers about, you know, different issues on air quality and tobacco control. And it was just really eye-opening to see how little our lawmakers and policymakers understand and also how little, frankly, our community understands, how little often physicians understand. Um, I've certainly learned a lot more about the impact of air pollution on health, um, just as I've started looking into this work um, with the American Lung Association and um, and then also realizing the outsized impact that, you know, lobby, like tobacco lobbies or business lobbies or, you know, construction, you know, in industries, et cetera, have, um, you know, on policymakers versus kind of people standing up for patients. Um, and so that's what really kind of drew me to do Air Health, Our Health to kind of add to, I'm a full-time clinician. I mean, I'm a 1.0 <laughs> FT. So to kind of add in the podcast and the website on the side was also just to kind of be more efficient with my my time <laughs> to share this information. Um, so if I'm doing a night shift, someone can still be listening to a podcast about air quality. <laughs> so tell me about your interactions with lawmakers. What are the challenges um, with you as a physician doing that? And for physicians who are thinking about doing the same, how can they make a difference by interacting with our lawmakers? Well, you know, I think um, it's also, I think it's really important to kind of know what you know and, and say what you know, and then, um, it, it, it's interesting how people have their kind of different worldviews. Um, definitely a lot of the worldview of lawmakers is, seems to be influenced by their, their, the budget. Um, and then also, um, you know, what the loudest constituents or voices in their particular district might be. Um, and a lot of the times people with lung disease or who are sick can't breathe, like they can't talk, they can't advocate for themselves, they can barely get to all their doctor's appointments. And so I think the doctor as an advocate, I think is really important because we're the ones that see the toll of the decisions that lawmakers make, right? So when they allow tobacco and vaping advertising near schools, where we know that there's, we had this like 23% increase in like teen vaping and, you know, just saying, oh, well, it's free market or that's how they, you know, that's this small business, you know, you don't understand business margins. They're barely staying ahead. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, but they're staying ahead on addicting a new generation to lifetimes of disease. It's just so short-sighted from a financial standpoint, right? Because kids who start vaping are more likely to switch to combustible cigarettes. And then all of us are paying, you know, Medicare, Medicaid premiums, mm -hmm. health insurance premiums, these insane costs for that lifetime tobacco addiction, you know, so it's just such a short-sighted kind of bottom line look sometimes um, that I think a doctor can kind of help bridge that perspective, right? You know, because I do think most people are people of goodwill who are kind of trying to do the best thing that they can, but sometimes it's just like the loudest voices or the voices that kind of make the short-term business bottom line case win. And a lot of the times the voices for health and clean air and, and that sort of thing, um, we have a longer time horizon, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately much more devastating costs if we don't take care of it. So I think trying to help lawmakers see that is really important. And when you shared your perspectives with lawmakers and how, how receptive were they to some of your arguments? Well, you know, I think some, some people are, you know, and some people aren't, and I'm sure it kind of comes from their different perspectives or sometimes people will say, oh yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, but I, you know, can't vote that way because of whatever the local concern is. Um, you know, I think, again, like I, I do think most people are kind of really trying to do 
the right thing. It can be uh, very frustrating, especially now, I think, um, with the current political climate. It's this, this, you know, trying to let science, you know, inform policy is, it seems, a harder and harder mm-hmm. um, with kind of how divisive everything is and this kind of tribalism um, is uh, really sad. <laughs> And if physicians wanted to be more involved politically or want to become advocates and interact with our lawmakers, what kind of advice and tips can you share with them? Well, I, I, I recommend um, trying to get in touch with organizations that are kind of, you think, aligned with um, that, um, who kind of would know who's efficient to talk to. When I first did it, I, I literally was just looking up on the legislative website, who are all the members of the health committee and going and trying to meet with them. And then you kind of quickly find out, oh, well, they don't, the health committee has no say over this tobacco policy that's over in ways and me and you're just like I don't know how to navigate this so things like the American Cancer Society American Lung Association American Heart Association a lot of the times depending on what your your passion is can be really helpful if they've got a lobbyist in your legislature and then the other thing I recommend is actually getting to know who represents you in in your state legislature so if you're trying to move a a bigger policy then you kind of need the bigger landscape but if I think it's very important um, for all of us to so much of you know tobacco policy or quality policy happens at the like you know county level the the local city level the um the state level and so looking up okay who's my county commissioner who's my um who's my state legislator who's my state senator who's you know who are these people and just sending them an email or calling and saying hi i'm a doctor who lives in your area and you know this is what i see for tobacco this is what i see for air pollution this is you know ozone you know even just looking up what your report card for your county is with the american lung association state of the air report and just saying like hey like my county was out of attainment for ozone and i've got a kid with asthma or i've got you know that's damaging to this and you know what are we doing to you know get newer diesel equipment what are what are we doing to move the needle on air pollution and i think um those things can be really helpful especially if they're coming from a doctor like i think mm-hmm. doctors voices are really important because frequently we're the only people in a lot of people's lives who have scientific literacy you know really i mean a lot of people kind of don't study science beyond whatever their last high school biology class was and so the person who knows the most about science in their lives is often their doctor and you know we see this with vaccine hesitancy we see this with so many things and so you know, we can kind of help explain to patients too, mm-hmm. you know, the connections between the air they breathe and their health, you know, whether it's indoor air quality, you know, mold cockroaches, you know, to, you know, particulate matter, ozone, um, and, you know, why it's, you know, important that the construction that's going on in their neighborhood is being done with, you know, newer tiers of diesel engines and, and that sort of thing. So let's transition now to the Kevin MD article that you wrote. It's titled An Anniversary, Reflecting on COVID-19 and Combustion. Now, for those who didn't read the article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Yeah, actually, this kind of goes up on the, uh, like, um, relates to kind of some of my legislative um, advocacy work. So at the time I hit the, I realized it was the anniversary of the first COVID-19 patient that had come to our hospital system. Our legislature was also considering bills to, um, you know, kind of do like a, a regulation of, you know, diesel emissions or, you know, particulate matter emissions at different construction sites in densely urban areas, as well as considering, um, you know, tobacco retail licensing, because actually in Oregon, like, you know, hey, I don't know if you want to start a side hustle, but you can just roll into the state now and start selling cigarettes out the back of your pickup truck. Like there is no retail licensing in our state. Mm -hmm. So we just like having like a basic, you need to have a license to sell tobacco. And just thinking about that, because we'd also recently crossed the 500,000 deaths from COVID mark. And I was just thinking, you know, 480,000 people die every year of tobacco in the United States, right? Like these should be cons- like, and COVID's on the headlines every day. Like we are losing like a half a million Americans every year to tobacco already, right? So this should also have this like public health urgency on like, how do we get in control of this, you know, pandemic? And then there's also this um, likelihood that people who have COVID-19 have a more rapid progression Um, Mm -hmm. If they smoke tobacco, right, which the tobacco industry has actually tried to publish articles in the literature saying that tobacco smoking is protective. One of those was actually withdrawn from publication Mm -hmm. after the Mm -hmm. tobacco ties were found. Um, So they're still doing their like misleading, you know, misdirection stuff, you know, that they're all found guilty of racketeering. I mean, they're still doing it in the medical literature. And then, you know, just a similar thing of just thinking about the generations of kids growing up in, you know, North Portland affected by air pollution. And we're not, and again, if you have, you know, there's another study that recently came out showing that like living in a high density of construction sites also 
increases your risk of the acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is obviously how people die most severely from COVID. And just realizing, you know, these are things that we have this kind of acute crisis with COVID-19, but we have these chronic crises of air pollution and tobacco that interact with COVID-19, right? So Mm -hmm. 17% of the mortality in the United States is actually attributable to PM 2.5 density. Um, So, you know, 17% of the people who've died from COVID-19, that kind of tip over into death was related to the air pollution in the area, right? And so it's in some areas that are very polluted, it's almost a quarter in some parts of China. Italy had a similar pattern. You know, so these kind of chronic part of our resiliency to future pandemics has to be cleaning up tobacco, cleaning up our air, so that when the next pandemic comes or the next surge, we are more resilient as communities. So hopefully in the next few months, we'll be at the tail end of the pandemic as immunizations uh, become more prevalent. Keep our fingers crossed, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So tell me about some of the legislation that you envisioned that can perhaps uh, be influenced by the pandemic. Um, Now you talked about, of course, you know, particular matter in the air, air pollution, but is there anything specific within Oregon where you practice that may be influenced by the recent pandemic? Well, yeah. Um, well, the things I would hope for would be, you know, we have tobacco, you know, retail licensing is kind of a first step. Oregon's already raised the, you know, tobacco age to 21. Personally, I think, you know, once we've raised the age 21, why should you be able to sell them in grocery stores? I mean, I personally think it's offensive that you can, you know, that pharmacies sell tobacco, that grocery stores are selling. I mean, it just like the kids can see it in the aisles. You know, I, I think there's a lot more to be done there. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, in terms of air pollution, you know, that Oregon's working to try to help businesses transition to cleaner diesel fleets. So I think things like, you know, developing funds to help because you don't want your businesses to go out of business, right? So it's mm-hmm. like trying to support businesses to be able to buy, you know, newer trucks or to retrofit older engines or make sure there's electrical infrastructure in place, you know, bills that allow for a transition to, you know, more electric fleets, right? We just need to stop burning things as a modes of transportation, right? So the American Lung Association published this entire road to clean air report, which looked at, you know, the, you know, the amount of money we would all save from decreased asthma, mortality, and, you know, burdens of disease and sick days and all that stuff just from transitioning when you know when a transition to electric vehicles finally happens and the sooner we can make that transition to electric vehicles happen for both our transportation sectors and our you know kind of individual you know sectors to, you know construction wherever we can go depending on technology like the fewer people are going to die and miss you know sick days and you know have lifelong illnesses um, and so I think just kind of continuing to try to push at both the local and national level, obviously national level would be more helpful, right? It's kind of silly to like try to patch these all together on the state mm-hmm. by state level, but your air resource board, like California Air resource board kind of looks at different areas that are not kind of in attainment for air pollution. Um, and so, you know, working to kind of push um, everyone to kind of consider when they make a policy decision about changing freeways or doing whatever they actually look at, okay, well, what's the burden of pollution at that, in that neighborhood or in that, you know, area already? And how is this choice going to affect that? And then what can we do, you know, to be different? Can we offer a clean, you know, like clean contracting standard, for example, where you say, okay, like part of our bid is going to say not only who's going to build this fastest and cheapest, but who's going to do it with the cleanest equipment, right? Like Mm -hmm. who's going to make sure that the kids playing in the the park nearby aren't inhaling, you know, black carbon and ozone at, you know, very high levels, um, you know, while they're, while they're doing it, because kids are very, very vulnerable. And, you know, I have three young children myself, so I think about them a lot, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, because they breathe more than we do, right? And they just, um, they inhale a lot more, um, you know, pollution or tobacco, any of the things they're inhaling are just much more likely to, you know, cause them lifelong disease. Now, as you reflect on the past year of the pandemic, through your lens as a critical care pulmonary physician, what do you think are the most um, important lasting legacies of the pandemic? I think you're going to see a lot more doctors as advocates. I think a Mm -hmm. lot of us thought there were adults in charge. I mean, I don't know how to say it more bluntly, but I think I, I had a different idea of who the, like what the United States government was. I think, I think I had a different idea of how leaders would respond in a crisis, you know, prioritizing life, prioritizing, you know, people's safety and recuperation and just watching you know, and maybe, maybe it's limited to one administration, but I'm not sure, you know, just willing to let people die to make numbers look good um, was, I think, disturbing to a lot of people in a way that a lot of us didn't expect. And so I think you see a lot of physicians kind of stepping up and saying, wait a minute, I am going to become an advocate. I am going to try to, you know, 
I don't know, run for something. I mean, that is not a path that I have any interest in, but a good friend of mine who's a pulmonary critical care doctor here in Oregon ran for the state legislature and now she's a state representative and she's Mm -hmm. an ICU doctor. And she just, I remember when she was jumping up and down and, you know, we were talking daily and writing a letter to the governor to shut down in Oregon, just seeing what we were seeing, talking to our colleagues in Washington state and in Italy and, and just realizing this is coming and the people who are supposed to be in charge are not taking charge. And so I think, I think a lot of doctors, we like to kind of compartmentalize our lives and we just, you know, we're so busy, right. And we train, you know, we train and we assume that everyone else kind of has similar hierarchies of expertise in their world. And just realizing that um, when it comes to our local government and our national government, we have to be active and vocal. And I think a lot of people like to say, oh, I don't do politics or like, I don't want to talk about that. And unfortunately um, politics leads to policy. Mm -hmm. And we all saw the massive failure of policy that left all of us, you know, at risk. We lost doctors. I lost professors of critical care who taught me have died in the pandemic. I mean, you know, people have lost colleagues. It's um, family. I mean, it's, it's, um, I think the option of compartmentalizing our lives as doctors and pretending that we don't have to worry about, um, you know, who's in charge and who's running the show is just not true and that we um, need to get involved um, and that it, and it has to be thoughtful and science-based and not just kind of like whatever tribe or team we happen to like. I mean, it's not sports, unfortunately. It's um, we have to lead with science and a respect for life. And I think um, that's the, we got all step up as doctors. And I'm hoping that's the good lasting legacy of COVID is that everyone gets more involved. We're talking to Erica Moseson. She is a pulmonary and critical care physician and she's the founder of Air Health, Our Health. She wrote the Kevin MD article, an anniversary reflecting on COVID-19 and combustion. Erica, one of the things that you mentioned is that physicians need to step up and be advocates. And in order to do so, it really helps if they have a platform. So I know you have a podcast and a platform. I have a podcast and a platform as well. Tell me about your journey in building that platform. What are some of the challenges that you face in doing that? And can you just um, share your story in the context of also being a busy practicing clinician as well? Because I know a lot of physicians are wondering how they can build their own platforms while also practice, practicing medicine. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, COVID-19 was like lit a fire under me. So I had bought the airhealthourhealth.org domain name a couple of years ago after I first started you know, I was realizing I didn't have the bandwidth to go to all these town halls about diesel. I mean, I just couldn't do it. Like I couldn't do that and put my kids to bed and do my shift. So I was like, well, I should just put a website where I put all this information out there. Um, and then I'm a, a big podcast listener. And then I, um, you know, I think COVID happened and, you know, everything kind of shut down. Everyone got vacations canceled. And I, you know, had kind of tuned into something about, you know, people who with like these different, um, you know, interviews with doctors who made websites and podcasts and stuff. And, and I, I remember I had downloaded a word WordPress site and, um, and, uh, and someone was like, well, doing WordPress isn't that hard, which was the opposite. Like first time I tried to do something, I found it so unintuitive. I was like, this is too hard. I can't Mm -hmm. do it. Then I felt like, you know, a little challenge. I was like, well, God, she can do it. I can do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So then I like opened up some YouTube videos and figured out how to do it. And then I, um, you know, I just kind of started out using this anchor app off my phone where I literally my first podcast interviews were just like over the phone because um, COVID was shutting down. And um, I actually started really, I was like, I have to do this because I thought we were all going to be in the ICU all the time and that we wouldn't have time for clinic um, and that we would just, I didn't know how many of us were going to die, which was like kind of a brutal mm. thing to say. But when that very young physician in China had died and I was like, you know, if we're going to lose pulmonary doctors like and there's this massive quantity of lung disease out there you know I want this knowledge to be there you know so people can like listen and learn and I put up sites on parts of the website like twitchy airways club for people with airway disease and stuff where um because I do think there is a lot of self-education once once patients with lung disease kind of understand what's affecting their lungs there is a lot that they can do you Mm -hmm. know to avoid triggers to just kind of understand the illness understand what's happening with like mucus plugging and stuff like that um so I kind of COVID was kind of like the impetus to be like this has to get out there (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then once you start like once you kind of start doing something and you kind of build a pattern you kind of figure out what's sustainable I'm like okay well I don't know how you do an episode every day that's (laughs) <laughs> mind blowing. Um, I do one every two weeks. And, you know, I kind of made my landing page bilingual because, you know, we, I'm, I'm not a native speaker, but my mom is, and we speak Spanish at home. And, and I was like, this really is needed for the Spanish language community. Cause when I first did some Instagram lives during the wildfires, the Spanish language ones were far more well attended and the, you know, Latino community in Oregon and all over is much more vulnerable to wildfires, outdoor work, that sort of thing. So 
now we've recently started Nuestro Aire Nuestra Salud, which is the Spanish language series um, on like, you know, asthma, COPD stuff. And I, you know, I've had people like, I've just incorporated them as like after visit links. Cause a lot of patients, mm-hmm. we don't have time in a 15 minute, 30 minute visit. You don't have time to talk about all the things that can affect your breathing. Right. And so I can just, I have this list of things and I can say, okay, like pollen, like go listen to the one on pollen or like, you mm-hmm. know, you know, there's like you, like, so I did one on, you know, cleaning agents, right. So people who work in, you know, housekeeping, cleaning, like that can actually have like an effect on your lungs, like pack a day at, at times, depending mm-hmm. on what you're using. And so, you know, links on that where people can just kind of go find it and listen and learn. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like start by starting, you know, mm-hmm. like, yep. and uh, someone I listened to someone told me what's like that the world will be saved by B plus work or C plus work or whatever. It's, <laughs> it's ugly. Like my website, not pretty. My podcast audio, I'm like, eh, I had a snip. There we go. You know, and, and now I'm getting some help, you know, and, and, and everything from which is great, but um, yeah, but it's, it's a creative outlet. I recommend physicians do it. It's a creative outlet. It gives you um, something outside yourself um, and something um, it, for me, it feels helpful to, if it can prevent anyone from ending up in my ICU. Um, that's a win. <laughs> yeah. And just to uh, add on to that, someone told me that if you start a podcast and your first episode is perfect, that means you started too late. <laughs> well, good. No, no, I definitely did not start too late. <laughs> And uh, my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin M, the audience? As always, don't light things on fire and breathe them into your lungs. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you for coming back on the show, Erica. And thanks again for sharing your time and insight. Absolutely. Thank you.